Must civilization perish in a hail of fiery atoms? Must freedom wither in a quiet, deadening accommodation with totalitarian evil? I'm scared. I'm scared of nuclear war. I'm scared of my own helplessness. Where can we go and what can we do and what are we going to grab? Any second, you know, it could happen, then you just be gone. I might not wake up because there could be nuclear war. Someday it could all end. It's really scary. By the time Ronald Reagan campaigned for president in 1980, he'd left no gray area in his feelings about communism and the Soviet Union. Though we should leave no initiative untried in our pursuit of peace, we must be clear-voiced in our resolve to resist any unpeaceful act wherever it may occur. Negotiation with the Soviet Union must never become appeasement. I think what's important to recognize is that Reagan did strongly fear the possibility of a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. It wasn't an abstract um, uh, prospect to him. Well, this was real, and it was what dominated the maturation of President Reagan. From his time in the film industry, when in the post-World War II period, this new threat, ideological as well as military, was on the minds of everyone in America. There was a very strong sense that war between the two superpowers was a real possibility. And that war in Europe was a real possibility. He fit very well into the, uh, into the stereotypes and cliches of, uh, of Soviet propaganda. So in a way, you could say you could hardly find uh, a, a better enemy for, uh, for the Soviet Union. He didn't feel that he is a warmonger, and once he realizes that fear on the Soviet side is genuine, he wanted to change that. Every time we had an incident, there were people in the administration who says, we have to stop talking to them, we'll show them. And Reagan would say, no, we don't walk away from negotiating tables. If there was any epiphany in Reagan's presidency is when he got shot and recognized he was living on borrowed time. As any near-death experience does to us, he recognized his, his hours were de being depleted, and he wanted to focus on the love of his life, his wife, and he wanted to focus on being seen as a peacemaker. That would be the epiphany. We see around us today the marks of our terrible dilemma, predictions of doomsday, anti-nuclear demonstrations, an arms race in which the West must, for its own protection, be an unwilling participant. At the same time, we see totalitarian forces in the world who seek subversion and conflict around the globe to further their barbarous assault on the human spirit. During part two of the Reagan presidency, we'll look at the administration's role in ending the Cold War. We'll explore the Reagan doctrine in Central America and the impact of the Iran-Contra affair. I respectfully decline to answer the question based on my constitutional rights. And we'll look at the Reagan administration's policies in the Middle East and their impact in the 21st century. I think that the events in Lebanon brought Hezbollah into uh, our sights for the first time, probably strengthened the Iranian hand uh, in Lebanon, and sent a bad message about what uh, the uh, attack on an American military installation could do to American will. We think about the period of the Reagan years, um, the 1980s, as the final decade of the Cold War. That's what Reagan's identified with. But it's also the first decade of what is sometimes called the global war on terror. Soviets do not withdraw their troops immediately from Afghanistan. 
I would not support the sending of an American team to the Olympics. I am not frightened by what lies ahead. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. When Ronald Reagan took office on January 20th, 1981, he assumed leadership of one of the two most powerful nations on Earth. The United States and the Soviet Union had been at odds for more than a generation. The Cold War conflict was symbolized by the wall dividing East and West Germany, and global alliances that, with few exceptions, took one side or the other. seemed a permanent feature of international politics. We were locked, after all, into this nuclear balance. Uh, we were locked into uh, a system, a bipolar system. The Soviet Union had its friends and allies. We had our friends and allies. The situation was seen as being very dangerous. Um, war was something um, which people thought of in real terms, not just, oh, theoretically there might be a possibility. Hell logic of this competition led us to believe that uh, the Cold War was a zero-sum game, that uh, for one to win, the other had to lose. Germans were vividly aware that if nuclear war was going to happen, a lot of it was going to happen on their territory, which meant partial or complete obliteration of the nation that we lived in. That was a slightly different feeling than growing up, say, in the Midwest. Reagan, naturally communicating with God, recognized his role was going to be to do away with nuclear weapons, not to increase them. That the, the key of his presidency was to make the world a safer place, not a more dangerous place. He wanted to engage them on a moral plane. He felt that too often in detente, which his predecessors had followed, we had been too easy on the Soviet Union and not explain how evil they were. President Reagan had lived through the 35 years of the Cold War and came to office with a fundamentally different view. He believed detente was wrong. It's one thing to engage when the engagement is around peaceful coexistence and detente. It's quite another when you've set the terms as uh, an end to Soviet power and uh, that engagement is toward that uh, outcome. The president was known for his stern policy against the Soviet Union. But just three months into office, Reagan lifted the U.S. grain embargo against the Soviets that had been imposed by former President Carter. The embargo was Carter's response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. But Reagan felt it was hurting the farmers. The grain embargo, my quarrel with it from the first was that I thought it was uh, it was asking only one group of Americans uh, to participate, the farmers. Grain was crossing borders again, but the two aging leaders were not. Heated rhetoric launched from behind podiums in Washington and Moscow took the place of face-to-face -face meetings. With the U.S. and NATO planning to deploy 572 new cruise and Pershing II missiles in Western Europe, Fear of nuclear war brought more than 250,000 Brits out to protest in London's Hyde Park. People were quite genuinely afraid of nuclear war. That made for a slightly apocalyptic mood. And that was the mood of much of the student protests against the stationing of the Pershing IIs, the nuclear mid-range um, missiles in Europe and Germany. The United States is prepared to cancel its deployment of Pershing II and ground launch missiles if the Soviets will dismantle their SS-20, SS-4, and SS-5 missiles. Not surprisingly, given the mutual mistrust, the Soviets did not agree to Reagan's so-called zero option. 
the real weapons are deployed in Europe and it's so close and they're clearly directed against the Soviet Union and in our propaganda that was of course portrayed as purely an aggressive move. We didn't know it was a response to the deployment of SS-20s by the Soviet Union in mid-late 70s in Europe. Some analysts at the time thought the Soviets had the nuclear advantage. The U.S. deployment, scheduled for late 1983, was seen as part of a large-scale military buildup, a measure reflected in the increased deficit spending in the federal budget. The Cold War was often fought thousands of miles away from the Soviet Union and the United States. Tensions were high in North and South Korea and the Philippines, and proxy wars were being waged in the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Central America. Following the withdrawal of U.S. support for dictator Anastasio Somoza de Valle in Nicaragua, the U.S. and Soviets took opposing sides in what became one of the most defining aspects of Reagan's foreign policy, the Reagan Doctrine. The Reagan Doctrine basically said that we don't accept that the Soviet Union has a dominant presence in places outside the Soviet Union. The Reagan Doctrine in Central America uh, was a part of Reagan's overall view that uh, the Soviet Union had to be challenged, and particularly in our own backyard. In early December, Reagan signed a presidential finding that authorized CIA and clandestine paramilitary support of anti-communist rebels known as Contras. Of course, we had our efforts in the Eastern European countries, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and so on. And the same is true in Nicaragua, where the Soviets, through the Cubans, were establishing themselves, or had established themselves. And there was a group of Nicaraguans called the Contras that were opposing, and we supported them. We were fighting a war in which the superpowers provided arms and money. Donde las superpotencias and the Central Americans provided the deaths. The Marxist guerrillas of Central America, the ones in El Salvador as much as the ones in Guatemala, traveled to Cuba all the time, and the Sandinistas were very close to Fidel Castro. In the United States, what they didn't want was a second Marxist-Leninist government because the Sandinistas had declared themselves Marxist-Leninists. It seemed to me to be a kind of uh, 1980s version of the domino theory. There wasn't a chance in the world the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were going to come across the Texas border. President Reagan, estaba obsesionado. President Reagan was simply obsessed with the Contras, and he really wanted to break the Sandinistas. A los Sandinistas. I met with people from the Reagan administration with great frequency. They came to me and explained with maps how the Contras were advancing on Managua, and the reality was something else. Clandestine support for the Nicaraguan Contras in 1981 soon spread to neighboring countries, and it marked the beginning of longer-term issues that came to plague the administration's policy in Central America. But the Cold War was global. Few parts of the world were spared the conflict. Soviet forces were engaged in a long war for control of Afghanistan, as Afghan Mujahideen battled back using U.S. weapons and support from the CIA. Moscow supported several countries in the Middle East, and protecting America's interests in the region became one of Reagan's greatest challenges. The Middle East has always been one of the biggest headaches of any modern president, and that's no exception for President Reagan. If you want to live a life of policy failures, by all means get involved in the Middle East, because it is, it is, it is a horribly frustrating environment. I believe that the Reagan policy in the Middle East did not make gains, and I would have to say uh, wasted the power of American uh, 
leadership and diplomacy in the period between June of 1982 and uh, the end of the first term. For those who draw a close connection between Reagan's Cold War policies and America's role in the Middle East, decisions made during the 1980s are still playing out. There wasn't much of a policy that was directed towards the region on the basis of the region itself. We were just looking at the success when it came to the U.S.'s relationship with the Soviet Union. But much of the problems that we have till this day in the region were born out of policies that either were put into place during Reagan or were continued during the Reagan years. Weighing Cold War objectives with long-simmering regional disputes created more than a few strange bedfellows. American interest in Iran stemmed from two matters primarily. First of all, it is a source of energy production, oil. It is also on the Persian Gulf, and in terms of Cold War issues, a site that was within plausible reach of the Soviet Union to establish presence on the Persian Gulf. Iran was without a Cold War ally and was still rebuilding from its own revolution when Saddam Hussein and Iraq invaded Iran's oil-rich south. The Iranian army and military was essentially in shambles. Most of its weaponry was American-built, and without the spare parts, it was at a standstill. Though the Soviets had a history of dealing arms to Iraq, the U.S. also opted to aid Iraq in what became an eight-year war between Iraq and Iran. The move threatened America's closest ally in the region, Israel. Iraq, from the Israeli perspective, was a primary enemy. The U.S. government is moving increasingly closer to the Saddam Hussein government in Iraq. This is a nightmare scenario for Israel. Israel views Saddam's Iraq as an existential threat. And there was a sense that Iran needed to be helped in order to ensure that it would not lose the war against Iraq. With the 1979 embassy takeover still fresh on the minds of most Americans, closer ties with Iran were unthinkable. But the civil war in Lebanon called for immediate attention. By 1982, southern Lebanon had become essentially the staging ground for the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. It was from southern Lebanon that the PLO was launching rockets into northern Israel. As in many other civil wars that take place in smaller countries, it very quickly turns into an arena for great powers to fight their own proxy wars. And Lebanon was no different. Lebanon had been locked in a civil war for most of the previous seven years. Israel and Syria had taken sides in the battle, as had Yasser Arafat and forces from the PLO. The US, Soviets, and Iran tried to influence the outcome through a mix of diplomacy and alliances of their own. As Reagan visited Europe for the first time during his presidency, Israel, in response to missile attacks fired against them from Lebanon, mounted an invasion force of its own. With Lebanese Christians as allies, 70,000 Israeli troops led by Defense Minister Ariel Sharon crossed the border in an effort to neutralize the PLO. Just two days later, Ronald Reagan became the first American president to address both houses of the British Parliament. Speaking for all Americans, I want to say how very much at home we feel in your house. The speech moment, demonstrated a sharp turn away from policies of detente. What I'm describing now is a plan and a hope for the long term the march of freedom and democracy, which will leave Marxism, Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. It was in that speech where he really laid out his belief that 
communism as a system was doomed to end up on the ash heap of history. I think it sent a signal to uh, the Soviet Union and to the rest of the world that um, Reagan was not a president who uh, was just going to be happy with the status quo. Words meant something to Reagan. It wasn't a game. It was for ultimately for telling the truth as you saw it, as best you could see it. In that incredibly strong rhetoric, he was setting new terms for the U.S.-Soviet relationship, that we were right in our values, the Soviet Union was wrong in its values. This was not going to be peaceful coexistence. This wasn't going to be detente. This was going to be the triumph of freedom. Ronald Reagan was representing the extreme part of the American conservative uh, ruling elite somewhere in the gray zone between the hardline conservative and what conservatives or and what the the soviet propaganda didn't hesitate to qualify as fascist public reaction in the u.s was mixed and millions of americans favored a nuclear freeze the people united will never be defeated nuclear fear escalated in europe as NATO allies faced crises around the world. In the summer of 1982, the economy was plunging. Argentina seizing the Falkland Islands from Britain, and so Britain was going to go to war against Argentina. And then Israel invaded Lebanon, and Reagan had this series of crises on his plate. He made the fateful decision to try and stabilize the situation and encourage Israel to withdraw from Lebanon by introducing American troops into Lebanon. With Israel, Syria, and the PLO already engaged in Lebanon's civil war, the U.S. joined France and Italy as part of a multinational peacekeeping force. The goal in 82 was to negotiate the withdrawal of both Israeli and Syrian forces for the larger goal of restoring an independent Lebanon. To do that, of course, you needed internal stability in Lebanon. Under a U.S. negotiated settlement, Yasser Arafat and the PLO fighters responsible for shelling Israel agreed to leave their camps in Beirut. But neither Syria nor Israel seemed clearly aligned with U.S. goals. The strongest Israeli alliance on the front was between Ariel Sharon and newly elected Lebanese president Bashir Gamal of the Christian Phalangist Party. We now know that Jamal and Sharon, who had a close relationship, that there was an understanding between them. Sharon was determined, and he was very powerful in this whole equation, and he had convinced Begin, we've really got to take care of this mess up there. We've got to do it right. The PLO encampments, which still housed thousands of Palestinian refugees, were surrounded by Christian phalangist forces. Sharon had really never believed that there weren't a whole lot of underground fighters left in the camps. So he had an understanding with Jamal that once Arafat and his boys are gone, if there's any trouble with these camps, you'll take care of it. The crisis worsened when Gamal was assassinated, his Christian Phalangist Party headquarters destroyed. Suddenly, the new president is no longer there, and the Phalangist leadership carries through on their understanding that we'll take care of the Palestinians. After the assassination of Gamal, the Christian Phalangist forces went into a rage. They wanted to enact revenge for this assassination. They went into two refugee camps, Shabra and Shatila, and while the Israeli army encircled those camps, took part in one of the most horrific massacres of that war. The rage led to the uh, slaughter of Palestinian women, children, with acquiescence of the Israeli government, they could have prevented it. It had a, a searing effect within the Reagan presidency. Millions of us have seen pictures of the Palestinian victims of this tragedy. 
There's little that words can add, but there are actions we can and must take to bring that nightmare to an end. The number of victims is disputed, but some estimates suggest that thousands of unarmed civilians were killed. U.S. forces played no role in the massacre, but some factions in the long-simmering Middle East conflict held the U.S. accountable based on its ongoing support of Israel and the government of Menachem Begin. President Reagan saw a need to stress to the Begin government the sense of outrage that he felt and to, to say in a very uh, pointed round of discussions with Begin that this could lead to a fundamental review of the United States relationship with Israel. For the United States to be seen as the ally that permitted or perceived to have permitted this massacre obviously did a tremendous amount of damage to America standing in the region. We all blame Sharon for having misled Begin. And I'm not sure how much of that is relevant. Clearly, Begin was not the author of these massacres. I'm not sure he was all that unhappy about them either. The international backlash was significant, and the massacre had a profound impact within Israel. During the months following the massacre, an internal Israeli investigation called the Kahan Commission determined that Israel was indirectly responsible for the massacre. The commission also declared that Defense Minister Ariel Sharon bore personal responsibility for failure to prevent the attacks. The massacre inspired significant consequences within Lebanon, including the growth of Hezbollah. The Iranian government played an instrumental role in bringing various Shiite factions together and form Hezbollah, which means the party of God. And the Syrians were a party to it and agreed to the Iranians using Syria as a conduit for both weapons and also leadership and training and emissaries and the rest. Yes, yes, Hezbollah is born out of that because it fills the vacuum uh, that is there. It uh, gains strength from the Iranian Revolution, which of course was just uh, three years earlier. It uh, gains strength from the sense that the United States uh, will not resist in the Middle East. Russian leader Leonid Brezhnev died in office before he and Reagan could even agree to meet. He was replaced by Yuri Andropov, the longtime head of the KGB, the Soviet equivalent of the CIA. In Washington, Democratic lawmakers remained focused on Reagan's policies in Central America. Under a national security decision directive signed by the president, the U.S. was spending millions to recruit and train Contra forces in Nicaragua. Democrat Edward Boland, chairman of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, engineered passage of a series of restrictive amendments prohibiting the use of U.S. government funding in support of military or paramilitary operations in Nicaragua. The Boland Amendment said if an administration, any administration, wishes to use public funds to conduct military operations, it must be approved by the Congress of the United States. And that's simply required by the Constitution. Yes, let us pray for the The Soviet threat in Central America was debatable, but the president's feelings about Moscow and the Eastern Bloc were not. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. Any country that has a government that allows its leader to kill over 20 million people, which Stalin did, is certainly not benign. It's not even neutral. It's evil. The convictions were that for all its faults, America was good. For whatever it may have accomplished in improving its living standards, the Soviet Union was evil. 
And that conviction was immovable. We were so desperate to have some semblance of normal relations with the countries in our neighborhood that we blinded ourselves to how bad these regimes were. Evil empire at the time struck us all as a willfully outrageous way of describing the Soviet Union. In retrospect, yes it was. It was pretty evil and so was East Germany. You're not allowed to read a Bible. You're not allowed to go to church. You're not allowed to have freedom of speech. You live in constant fear. Well, you know, what's there to admire about a country of, of thuggery like that? Um, and so Reagan understood that and always had the moral high ground. This is why I'm speaking to you tonight, to urge you to tell your senators and congressmen that you know we must continue to restore our military strength. With his approval rating near its all-time low, President Reagan used a nationally televised speech to announce what the administration termed a strategic defense initiative. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies? The idea of using space-based defense systems to shoot down nuclear missiles before they could reach their target was a bold step. What do we do best? What would leverage our economic potential to where when we spend a dollar, they have to spend two dollars on the other side, or three, or five? Whether defense would work, the missile defense program, was yet to be determined, but the United States under Reagan was going to be very busy on the technology side in engaging the Soviet Union in a technology race that it had never quite seen before. Many questioned whether the so-called Star Wars project was technically possible, or was it economic warfare? So where were we? We were at a point where the Soviet Union had about three times as many land-based warheads, first strike warheads, as we did. Now, if you can't get them to unilaterally reduce and you can't get our side to deploy the MX missile, what can you do to account for the risk you're running by this three to one advantage in a first strike system? Well, the kind of obvious answer is you catch all those. You prevent them from ever reaching your side with defense. Well, that's easy to say and, and not necessarily feasible. It was interpreted on the Soviet side like an intention to, yes, protect the United States, to build for themselves a defensive shield, but with one obvious purpose, to be secure in the situation of a first strike uh, directed against the Soviet Union. The assumption on the part of many, particularly their military, that this was a strategy to make a first strike possible. In other words, we would put up a defense uh, that would protect us and then we would attack them and they would have no deterrent uh, to keep us from attacking. It was seen as capable of genuinely destabilizing the balance of mutual assured destruction. It would give the Americans a supremacy, potentially, that we thought the Soviets might feel they had to react to with a preemptive nuclear strike, and guess where that would land? Not good. Robert McFarlane was among the architects of SDI, but he and the president held slightly different views of the SDI program. Yes, it's a military system, but its impact is economic, imposed such a burden on the Soviet economy that it simply cannot bear it by investing in what we do best, high technology. Well, I don't want to mislead you. <clears throat> that wasn't President Reagan's motive. He wanted to build it. The Soviet economy was compromised by more than just the arms race. Many in the administration believed the Soviet war in Afghanistan was taking its toll. The country is stagnating. There is a growing understanding that change will have to come, even at the highest level and in the population, that we simply cannot live like this any longer. At the end of the day, 
the Soviets committed their own mistake by going into Afghanistan, getting themselves tied down there, and then bleeding to death in that country. The Reagan administration support for Afghanistan's so-called freedom fighters never involved American troops. Lebanon was a different story, and the consequences for the U.S. escalated when a 2,000-pound suicide car bomb exploded in front of the American embassy in Beirut. This criminal attack on a diplomatic establishment will not deter us from our goals of peace in the region. We will do what we know to be right. 63 people were killed, including 17 Americans, eight of whom worked for the CIA. El Salvador is nearer to Texas than Texas is to Massachusetts. As the Cold War played out with a clearly marked agenda in Nicaragua and El Salvador, the president, in one of his least persuasive roles, pleaded with Congress to fund the Contras. If we cannot defend ourselves there, we cannot expect to prevail elsewhere. Our there were lots of Democrats in the Congress who felt that we shouldn't be supporting the, the Contras even uh, rhetorically. So there's a difference of opinion. And they denied um, funding for what we wanted to do. He believed he was doing good in Central America. He believed that these thugs we were paying were freedom fighters. I mean, it was a, it was a total folly. And the fact that he made so many speeches and statements about it compared to what the historical importance of it is, which is pretty close to zero, uh, the, uh, he thought he was doing the right thing. No, era un poco exagerado. It was a bit exaggerated to call them freedom fighters. But certainly he was supporting them and they believed it. And it became my mission that the triumph would not happen militarily. At the Kremlin, the Soviets were still pondering the idea of weapons in space, as well as the toll it might take on the Soviet economy. Throughout 1983, you have discussions about how can we respond. It was taken absolutely seriously. How do we respond? We, there has to be a response. Well, we can't, we can't afford the same technology. We have to come up with an um, asymmetric response. Many of the, of the Soviets didn't think it would work, but they couldn't take a chance. It might work. The Americans come up with wild stuff all the time. What if they come up with a defensive system? A lot of military, now they write in their memoirs and in interviews, oh, we knew it was not doable. We knew it was, you know, we knew. But at the time, this is not how they responded. They said, threat serious, they're ready. This is how, unfortunately, a drop of thought. And there is a lot of evidence indicating that he seriously was afraid of SDI, seriously. In a June 22nd letter to Reagan, Soviet leader Yuri Andropov suggested the two countries focus on, quote, the elimination of the nuclear threat. Though the pitch was reminiscent of Reagan's zero option proposal, the letter did not provoke a significant response from the White House. Rhetorical games between the U.S. and the Soviet Union had a long history, but the real risk of nuclear war had rarely been greater it escalated to a tipping point on September 1st, 1983. 269 people were killed when a Soviet fighter jet shot down a civilian passenger jet, Korean Airlines Flight 007. The jet was off course and in Soviet airspace, but the downing was viewed as an act of aggression against the United States, South Korea, and its allies. It was a horror, and we led the charge against them for that on a world basis. The fact is that they did recover the black box. They had no evidence ever that this was a spy plane. Even 
the communications by the fighter pilot who said that he could see the plane, the strobes were flashing. Now, a spy plane doesn't flash strobes. A passenger plane does. The choices that both sides made were Cold War choices. But the decision was made to say this is an act of absolute evil. And on the Soviet side, they decided to cover up. And that just immediately erased any remnants of trust. We have the Politburo document where they make decision to cover up. And of course, as everything in the Politburo, it's unanimous. The Soviets admitted shooting down what they claimed was a spy plane. This was the Soviet Union against the world and the moral precepts which guide human relations among people everywhere. It was an act of barbarism. The president was hailed by many for his strong rhetoric. And while the incident sparked protests and increased tension, it did not provoke military action. Let's be realistic. The United States and the Soviet Union were in death grip of nuclear forces aimed at one another, our most, uh, our most important and uh, most capable military forces uh, aimed at each other across the the uh, Volta Gap in Europe, uh, armed to the teeth across the world. I doubt that there was ever real serious consideration to war with the Soviet Union. War between superpowers was averted, but the civil war in Lebanon continued. U.S. forces remained on the sidelines as Reagan's national security team battled inside the White House. There was a serious sharp division in the administration between the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense. Secretary Weinberger disagreed quite emphatically with allowing the Marines to become involved in any kind of combat in Lebanon. He believed that our larger interests in the Middle East were oil and in maintaining good ties with the producers of oil in Saudi Arabia and beyond. The leaders of Hezbollah had their own agenda. Just six months after bombing the U.S. Embassy, terrorists struck again at the heart of the multinational peacekeeping force. 241 American servicemen were killed when a suicide bomber drove a truck loaded with explosives into their barracks. Moments later, a second coordinated attack killed 58 French soldiers from the same multinational force. If Lebanon ends up under the tyranny of forces hostile to the West, not only will our strategic position in the Eastern Mediterranean be threatened, but also the stability of the entire Middle East, including the vast resource areas of the Arabian Peninsula. The motivation for Hezbollah's attack on the U.S. Embassy and then again on the Marine barracks was quite clear. They did not want to see the United States create a permanent presence in southern Lebanon. The deaths of Americans at the U.S. Embassy and in the military barracks in Beirut was a generalized turning point in which the Americans realized that they were not only engaged in a Cold War with the Russians, but also in a war on terror in the Middle East. Is it the global war on terror? Is it the long war? I think Lebanon really speaks to the difficulty that Reagan faced with those fundamental questions of having a global conflict of a nature that's different than anything that he had been preparing for in the Cold War fight. That moment, I think, was the first time in which most Americans understood that a new enemy was on the horizon that the wars of the next century were not going to be between nation states, but between superpowers and these small terrorist organizations. The violent attack and murder of 241 Marines in their barracks in Lebanon was a devastating blow to the American psyche and a blow to American self-confidence. Americans uh, did not want military forces in that part of the world, especially when it was clear that they were creating more instability and not uh, stabilizing the situation. They were a toxic uh, outside element. <laughs> 
there's anything that happened in the Reagan administration that I second guess myself and everybody else on. It's that Operation in Lebanon. I'm a Marine, so it particularly hit me hard. It hit everybody hard. I would say that was the worst day of the Reagan administration. President Reagan decided that the situation was too uh, dangerous, but he never called it a uh, withdrawal or a retreat. He said merely that the Marines or the U.S. forces would remain in the area, but they would redeploy to ships offshore. Our mission, I think, makes sense. The long-term impact of the president's decision to withdraw forces remains controversial. We're going to make every effort we can to minimize the risk, but also to find those responsible. For the United States not to respond, not to impose a cost whenever Americans were killed anywhere, had the effect of stimulating a conclusion on the part of Iran at the time and Sunni terrorists, Al-Qaeda ultimately, that attacking Americans was cost-free. It was a foreshadowing of what has become today a very, very serious global threat. We didn't have a so-called war on terrorism, but we were fighting it nonetheless with much less in the way of weapons. So I guess you could say that's, that's a precursor of what's going on today with different, different tools. It represented a decade of a radical shift in American thinking about what was the core challenge in the international system. That, when I think about it, is probably the one example in the Reagan administration that uh, perhaps looking back on it, they might have done differently. Um, it set off then, I think, a whole series of events in Lebanon and in the Middle East that we probably ultimately paid for in uh, terrorism's forward march until we finally had to confront it after September 11th. Bodies were still being counted in Lebanon when the president used National Security Decision Directive 110 to authorize a second simultaneous mission in the Caribbean. A U.S. Navy carrier task group bound for Lebanon was diverted to battle in one of the smallest countries in the Western Hemisphere, a former British colony called Grenada. Just slightly larger than Martha's Vineyard, most journalists couldn't find Grenada on a map. But that made little difference since the military, in an unprecedented move, prohibited journalists from documenting the conflict. Early this morning, forces from six Caribbean democracies and the United States began a landing or landings on the island of Grenada in the Eastern Caribbean. Grenada was a strange enterprise, frankly. I don't think there was ever any doubt that the United States of America was going to defeat Grenada. To observers of the Reagan doctrine playing out in Central America, the invasion of Grenada may have seemed obvious. Reagan was beginning to develop policies that would take the United States away from this notion of Vietnam. We do nothing at all we, because we can't win. The invasion was authorized with the support of some members of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, though their vote was not unanimous. Maurice Bishop, the self-imposed Grenadian leader, had been executed in a coup during the week prior to the U.S. invasion. But it was unclear whether U.S. citizens on the island were in danger. There was a general sense that the raid was intended to minimize Cuban influence on the tiny island. The Cubans were clearly playing a role in the construction of a new airport, but so were contractors from England, Canada, and Finland. The United States objectives are clear, to protect our own citizens, to facilitate the evacuation of those who want to leave, and to help in the restoration of democratic institutions in Grenada. Hundreds of journalists gathered in nearby Barbados, but they were not allowed into Grenada. Americans and Congress were left searching for answers. Are we looking for a war we can win? asked Florida Senator Lawton Childs. If American citizens were not in danger, how can we justify the invasion? asked presidential candidate Walter Mondale. 
nearly 8,000 American forces participated in a war that was over in just a few days. Thousands of miles from Grenada, West Germany geared up for winter and for the deployment of more than 100 U.S. Pershing II ballistic missiles. But the coldest spot in Europe was a negotiating table in Geneva. The present round of the negotiations is discontinued without any date set for their resumption. For the first time in more than 20 years, Soviet diplomats walked away in defiance. Nicaragua, El Salvador, Iran, Lebanon, Grenada, Afghanistan, Europe, the Soviet Union. Few parts of the world were safe from the Cold War. I am therefore announcing that I am a candidate and will seek re-election to the office I presently hold. As the president announced his bid for re-election, many voters hoped that his stated appetite for peace would soon be satisfied. A Gallup poll taken shortly after his announcement showed that 49% of Americans disapproved of his handling of foreign policy. Only 38% approved. With Time Magazine's provocative Men of the Year issue still circulating, Soviet leader Yuri Andropov died of kidney failure. Reagan writes into his diaries, how can I talk to them if they keep dying on me? So you have uh, Brezhnev dying in November 1982. Andropov comes in, very quickly becomes very sick. Andropov was really hoping that Gorbachev would be his replacement. But because of the political intrigue within the Politburo, Chernyenko becomes Andropov's successor. So th there is no possibility of dialogue. We were not aware that Reagan was trying to engage them. Considering the intensity of the Cold War and the international fear of nuclear conflict, one American's disappearance in Lebanon may not have seemed newsworthy. But the March kidnapping of William Buckley, the CIA station chief in Beirut, escalated the stakes between Iranian-backed Hezbollah and the United States. The kidnapping became a catalyst for a new clandestine discussion involving the U.S., Israel, and Iran the outcome would lead to profound implications for the Reagan presidency and a long-term impact on America's policies in the Middle East. We thank the citizens of the United States. As the president States campaigned for a second term, CIA involvement in Nicaragua was cloaked in secrecy. The same was true of administration efforts to bypass Congress with offshore funding for the Contras. But the president's convictions remained strong. Our policy is simple. We are not going to betray our friends, reward the enemies of freedom, or permit fear and retreat to become American policies, especially in this hemisphere.